At the moment, I think we're very inconsistent on how we make these decisions. So if you look at various different hospitals within London, some patients are referred for an ultrasound scan and some aren't. And the information that's requested on the ultrasound imaging is also variable. And then how clinicians act on that ultrasound finding is also variable. But best practice dictates that essentially a patient should have an ultrasound scan in full ankle equinus. So essentially with the toes pointing down and you're looking for the size of the gap. So the size of the gap is really, really important because it can dictate whether or not a patient should be managed surgically or whether they might do well with conservative treatment. Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have with us Lizzie Marlow. Lizzie is an educator and a physio specialising uh, more so in the lower limb with special interest in running injuries, lower limb tendinopathies and the subject of today is uh, something that Lizzie has a particular interest in, Achilles ruptures and has actually looked at the pathways that the NHS uses and where we can potentially streamline and, and yeah improve the, the likes of that but Lizzie why don't we take two minutes introduce yourself to the audience for those who might not be familiar and then we're just going to dive on into the fascinating world of Achilles ruptures. <laughs> Thank you Sunny. So yeah as Sunny said my name is Lizzie I work as a musculoskeletal extended scope physio within the NHS I'm predominantly within a lower limb and a spinal role um, and as Sunny said I've had some involvement in development of local clinical pathways within orthopaedics and I think that's really where my interest in the Achilles started. Uh, I also work privately within a lower limb rehab role um, and I'm more involved in the active sporty patients within that role and then I work as a lecturer as well predominantly within the lower limb and in particular the foot and ankle which is a particular interest of mine. Yeah, fantastic. Well, um, I think one of the first things for us to to uh, a bridge to cross for Achilles ruptures is how do you go about diagnosing them? Because I know for my education uh, where I studied, we were pretty much told, "Hey, yeah, do the the Thompson squeeze, and if that's positive, then away you go." But that's not the be all and end all, is it? Because we've got a few other muscles that can do the job down there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the Achilles ruptures are certainly a condition that's often missed within A&E and within physio clinics. Um, so it's really important that we do have um, a way of identifying these patients early. And for me, the history is absolutely essential. So patients often describe the feeling that they've been kicked in the back of the leg. Um, so I know a friend of mine went for a run with her mum the other day. And her mum turned around and said, why on earth did you just kick me in the back of the leg? And my friend's a physio, so she knew straight away what had happened. So I think that's something really important to tease from the history. They often also describe a snapping sound. So sometimes they think they've actually fractured something. Um, it can often be a fairly innocuous mechanism of injury. So they might be running or jogging uphill, perhaps doing some skipping or lunging. So it's typically a forced dorsiflexion or perhaps a forced plantar flexion contraction within a dorsiflexed position. And pain is not typically a predominant feature of these patients. So sometimes they actually present late or perhaps they're not picked up in A&E. And it's assumed that because the patient can do a heel raise in A&E, sometimes perhaps the patient doesn't have a, a rupture and, and that's absolutely not the case. You know, patients can have uh, a complete rupture of the Achilles and still perform a heel raise because they can compensate quite well with their long flexor tendons. So the classic triad of tests for me would be the Simmons triad. So this is a cluster of tests which is highly sensitive. So if it's negative you can fairly confidently exclude an Achilles tendon rupture. So the Thompson squeeze, as you mentioned, is a really useful test. And that's definitely one I would recommend. So you typically get the patient to lie prone and squeeze their calf. I know that physio tutors have a really good YouTube video on this for anyone who's unsure. And you're looking for a, a plantar flexor reaction within the foot. 
There are a couple of other tests as well that I think are important to look at. So you've got the Mattel's test, which is sometimes referred to as the angle of declination. So you're essentially getting the patient to lie prone or kneel with their sort of foot resting over the edge of a chair. And you're looking at the resting position of the feet. So you compare the uninjured to the injured side. And an uninjured Achilles tendon is going to have some tension on the back of the heel, which means that the foot rests in a bit of plantar flexion, um, whereas an in, a ruptured Achilles is going to rest in a more dorsiflexed position. So that's a really useful test. And then um, the last test that I would, I would consider would be looking for a gap or palpating for a gap. So the most common location would be within the mid body of the tendon, but you can also get a rupture at the insertion onto the calcaneus or higher up within the muscle tendon junction. So you want to palpate all along the length of the tendon and the muscle tendon junction as well. Okay. Um, one interesting point that you brought up there is that pain isn't always a big indicator. Now, of course, for some people, absolutely it is. Those people who feel like they've been kicked in the back of the calf or uh, some people who feel like they've, they've had a snap. Um, why is that, that that pain sometimes isn't there when someone ruptures their Achilles? It's a very good question. And I'm not sure I know the absolute answer, but I suspect that it's partly because it's a pretty avascular area. Um, so the particular part of the Achilles tendon that typically ruptures doesn't have a great vascular supply and probably not the best um, neural tissue supply either. So that's a potential theory um yeah so I, i'm not 100 percent sure actually hmm. interesting um now uh one thing that up until our conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago um for me was always super 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 important was make sure you get seen as quick as possible to identify it and then get your ass to surgery now i have my bias there i'll throw that out but you enlightened me on a couple of things but with that said, why is it important to identify this kind of injury as soon as possible and not let it fall by the wayside? Yeah, that's a really good question. So essentially, when the Achilles tendon ruptures, you have that acute inflammatory phase and you have a hematoma that starts to form within the tendon gap. And that starts to consolidate over a period of a, a couple of days. And essentially it will block the tendon ends from coming together. And it means that conservative treatment options are gonna be less useful. So it's really, really important if somebody ruptures their Achilles tendon that they get to A&E as soon as possible and they are positioned in ankle equinus. So that means you plan to flex the foot so that the toes are pointing down. And this is the best position to allow the tendon ends to come together. Um, before the hematoma starts to consolidate within the tendon gap and before you start to get the proliferation and the scar tissue that will, of course, stop the tendon ends from healing in an appropriate position. Is there a way to optimize that? Because I know of people who have had their foot casted um, and it hasn't been in the right position. So they've been taken out of the cast and actually the tendons not properly connected or what have you is there any way that how do we do it currently and is there a way that we could do it better i think would be the best way to phrase that question yeah absolutely at the moment i think we're very inconsistent on how we make these decisions so if you look at various different hospitals within london some patients are referred for an ultrasound scan and some aren't and the information that's requested on the ultrasound imaging is also variable. And then how clinicians act on that ultrasound finding is also variable. But best practice uh, dictates that essentially a patient should have an ultrasound scan in full ankle equinus. So essentially with the toes pointing down and you're looking for the size of the gap. So the size of the gap is really, really important because it can dictate whether or not a patient should be managed surgically or whether they might do well with conservative treatment. So if the gap is less than one centimeter, that's an indication that 
perhaps the patient could be casted in that position, so in full ankle equinus, um, and then they may do well with a conservative treatment protocol, depending on the protocol, and we'll come into that a little bit later. If the gap is larger than one centimetre, then it's less likely that the patient is going to do well with conservative treatment, and they may be better off having a surgical opinion if they're a surgical candidate. So, of, of course, some patients are not a surgical candidate if they're perhaps older or they've got lots of comorbidities, which mean that they might not have a good surgical outcome. But yeah, the size of the gap in full ankle equinus is what's absolutely crucial. And this is linked to long term outcomes. So they've looked at patients who have a gap of more than one centimeter who are managed conservatively. And it is associated with a higher risk of re-rupture. And it's also associated with uh, poorer strength outcomes and also lower scores on something called the ATRS, which is the Achilles tendon rupture score, which is a good sort of fairly reliable and fairly valid outcome measure that looks at things like pain and return to uh, function, return to sport participation. So if you have a large gap in full ankle equinus and you're managed conservatively, you may not do as well in the long term. So it is really, really important that patients have an ultrasound scan in those early stages. Okay, see, that was going to be my next question of, is there any uh, difference in the long term outcomes for surgical versus non surgical in things like return to sport? And uh, it seems like you've already knocked that question out uh out the park really uh, as it kind of depends on that gap in the tendon from what i'm hearing right it does depend on the gap but it also depends on the conservative protocol that is selected as well so i think that the tendon gap is a really really important early indicator but then also how that patient is immobilized in those early stages can dictate the long-term outcomes as well and then of course the actual rehab protocol that they follow so there's huge variation in the literature in terms of uh, strength protocols and of course that's going to have a huge impact on on the patient's return to full sort of function and strength so I'm, I'm sure we can talk about that as we go through absolutely I think um what we'll do then we'll we'll follow that down the path that it will lead first with the conservative management. So you mentioned that it depends how it's immobilized as one of the key factors um, going into even before the rehab phase. What what do you mean? Surely it's a, a, a moon boot and away you go. <laughs> In theory, yeah. So there are a few different ways of immobilizing a patient. And there's a really interesting study by Philip Ellison and his colleagues. So they looked at different immobilization strategies and the amount of equinus that you can achieve at the ankle. And it was really interesting findings. So he looked at a full equinus cast. He looked at a standard air cast boot with five wedges. And then he looked at something called the Vacoped dynamic functional brace, which rather than having the standard wedges, uh, has more of a dynamic hinge and you can lock it in 30 degrees of plant flexion. Then you can slowly release the hinge so that they can move between 15 and 30 and then naught to 30, etc. So he did lateral uh, radiographs of patients within these different immobilization orthoses. Um, and he found that the best strategy for achieving ankle equinus was the cast, the air car, uh, the Aquinas cast, the full Aquinas cast. So you got good Aquinas at the ankle joint. When you look at the standard air cast boot with five wedges, it's actually really interesting because a lot of the plantar flexion is actually happening at the midfoot rather than the ankle joint itself. So it does mean that perhaps that tendon is healing, is not healing in optimum length and tension if they're managed in the air cast boot straight away. So it's definitely an argument for starting the patient off in, an, in a full Aquinas cast initially so that that tendon has a chance to heal in optimum length and tension. 
and reduces the risk of Achilles tendon lengthening in those early stages, which can actually have catastrophic effects later down the line. When you look at the vacoped functional boot with the dynamic sort of hinge on it, they get much better equinus at the ankle than the standard air cast boot with wedges. Unfortunately, it's a lot more expensive. So it's very hard to get funding for that within NHS services. And, you know, you would need to put some sort of business case forward. But within the private sector, I think it's a really, really useful immobilization strategy for the patient to go into after they've been in the standard full equinus cast. But I think all patients who are managed conservatively should have two weeks within a full equinus cast. The other benefit of the dynamic brace, the vacoped dynamic functional boot, is that you can get some early functional loading through the Achilles tendon because you get to move within a functional appropriate range. And, you know, we know that loading a tendon has really positive effects on fibroblast proliferation, collagen synthesis, optimizing tendon mechanical properties, improving the quality of the scar tissue and limiting things like significant calf atrophy or calf weakness that are really difficult to overcome in those later stages. So yeah, for me, the best practice would be two weeks in an Aquinas cast and then the vacoped functional dynamic brace. Okay, fantastic. And then what is it about the rehab protocols that varies so much and how can we then optimize that or begin to try to standardize that i think it's over the years we just haven't come to any kind of consensus on what the best exercises are when we should start loading patients how we should progress them and i think that's partly because we deal with such a mixed population so the the patients that are most likely to rupture their Achilles tendons are the weekend warriors aged 30 to 50. Whereas, but you also get this peak incidence after the age of 50 in those patients who perhaps have comorbidities and, and other risk factors like steroid exposure, which increases their risk of having a rupture. And so it's hard to get a protocol that kind of caters for these wide this wide range of of, um, this wide population Um, but there is a protocol out there that I think is really leading the way in terms of management of Achilles tendon ruptures and that's the SMART protocol um, which was developed in the uh, mid 2000s by a lady called Anne-Marie Hutchinson in Swansea so it's very much an MDT protocol it's developed alongside the MSK radiologists and uh, foot and ankle consultants as well but that is world class in my opinion in terms of how we should be managing these patients so they talk about the early ultrasound scan And then they go on to talk about the specific immobilization strategies. And then they give really clear guidance on uh, appropriate rehabilitation protocols and when to progress the patient. So, yeah, the SMART protocol, if anyone wants some useful literature to read, I would encourage you to have a look at that. So it stands for the Swansea Morriston Achilles Rupture Treatment I'm going to latch on to the last little bit that you said there on how and when to progress, because I think that's something that really has come to the fore in um, the last few years, at least in uh, criterion based uh, progression rather than time based progression. Don't get me wrong. um, The human body is a human body and physiology does move at a certain rate but some people might be slower than others and some people may respond really well. So what are some of the criteria that we can start using in order to gauge progression and gauge where people are? Yeah, it's a really good question. And like you say, it's quite a difficult one to have clear guidance on because patients are so different and patients, some patients do really well and they just progress through really quickly and they meet all their milestones and others really struggle with pain and swelling and all sorts of complications. So you do need to judge each patient um, individually, but there are some sort of logical progressions that you can have a think about. And I think it's first of all, just worth separating the rehabilitation into clear 
progressions. So you've got, for me, there are five key stages. So you've got the stage one, which is essentially the immobilization stage where they're in the cast and the main goal is to protect the tendon so that it heals in optimum length and tension. Then you've got stage two, which is the controlled mobilization and early rehab stage. And again, your goal there is to protect the tendon, avoid lengthening and start getting normal gait pattern. And then you progress on to your stage three, which is the mid stage, which is around about the time where the boot is removed and they start you know, normal daily function and walking without it. And then stage four is your late stage where you're starting to increase strength, endurance and introduce some speed and power. And then you've got your return to sport, which is around the six, six to eight month mark. So if we just talk about perhaps stage one, a stage two, sorry, where you have the controlled mobilization and early weight bearing. So in this stage, you know, you're just really focusing on starting to get some early plantar flexion activation. So you start physio exercises around about four or five weeks when you're starting to get some tendon proliferation, tendon cell proliferation. Um, so I would normally focus on non-weight bearing exercises within this stage. Um, and then towards the end of that stage, when you progress onto the boot removal, you're gonna start progressing onto weight bearing exercises. So, this is the point where you start doing your, your weighted double leg heel raises. So you can start these around about the sort of 10 to 12 meet week mark when the patient is removing the boot. And I think the things to focus on in terms of deciding when the patient is ready to progress from that is weight bearing symmetry, getting good palpable calf activation during the heel raise. And you can use a complex as well um, just to sort of improve that calf muscle activation and looking at plantar, flex, plantar flexion height. So the amount of heel lift that they get when they do it. So weight bearing symmetry, calf activation and heel raise height are important things to decide if someone is ready to progress on to the next stage. I think in those early stages as well, for me, getting a normal gait pattern is absolutely crucial before you progress on to anything more complex. And I think orthopedics are often very quick to abandon crutches as soon as the patient is out of the boot, but actually that can really limit their ability to get good push off during the final stages of gait. So I think it's more important to focus on achieving adequate push off during those later stages and a nice quality gait pattern than trying to walk unaided. So in terms of progressing from early, from the middle stage, you wanna have a good quality walking pattern with adequate push off. You wanna have a good quality weight bearing heel raise with good symmetry and good plantar flexion height. Um, and then, you know, control pain and swelling. And then you might want to start thinking about progressing on to the later stages. So this is around the four to six month mark we're talking about now, where the goal is really to increase strength, endurance, speed and power. Um, so it, this is the point where you might start thinking about objective markers, you know, strength markers. Um, so in the early stages, there's going to be a significant difference between left and right in terms of the strength that they're going to achieve. So if you have access to isokinetic strength testing, then that's great. But a lot of people don't have that luxury. So you can use things like the seated calf raise in the gym or perhaps the standing calf raise machine. Or if you don't have access to that and you're within an NHS setting, you can just look at body weight repetitions. Um, or using perhaps an external load on a seated calf raise. But when patients are sort of progressing from four to six months, you want them to be able to start aiming towards their body weight really on a seated calf raise machine. And certainly if they're returning to sport, you want them to be able to do 1.5 times their body weight really, because the soleus muscle is pretty strong and it's a power muscle and it's really important for things like running. And then with the calf press machine, which they might do in standing, you're going to start off by aiming for body weight, but slowly progress to sort of perhaps 1.5. Some I think they would probably struggle with that. 
um, in, in the earlier stages, but certainly for the more elite athletes who are hoping to return to high level sport, you're looking at 1.5 times body weight really on that. And by what stage are you looking for that 1.5 times your body weight then? At, at what so, period? Yeah, good question. And, and again, everyone seems to be so different in the way that they progress with these things. And of course, it, it depends on whether or not they've had surgery, because we do find that patients who have had surgery tend to achieve their strength markers a bit quicker. Um, but we're, we're looking at towards the six month mark, really, for that. Okay. So you've got someone in clinic they're doing really really well they're able to hit their 1.5 times body weight they're both in seated and in standing uh, their symmetry between both legs looks really good are you doing any other uh, tests or anything in order to gauge whether or not you're ready for the return to play or return to sport aspect of it are we talking sort of slightly later down the line yeah yeah, so around sort of the six to nine month mark and, you know, if someone's really achieved their strength markers, they've got good endurance, they're tolerating a little bit of jogging, perhaps some changes of direction, etc. You start to think maybe this patient's ready to consider a return to sport. Um, so I don't recommend anyone return to sport before six months. And typically I would aim for eight months, really. I think this is a really slow process. It's not something that we can accelerate. And it's a bit like ACL injuries. You know, we went through this stage of thinking we could accelerate everything and then realized that didn't work so well. And I think the Achilles is largely the same. We need to be patient. But when you get to that point where you think that the patient is ready, there are a few things that I would look at. So uh, looking at a functional movement screen, I think is, is important. So looking at weight bearing symmetry on your core movement patterns like squats, lunges and step ups. And then something like the limb symmetry index, I think is really useful. So you can use that for your strength testing, maximum strength testing, perhaps like an eight rep max for your calf. I think it's also important to look at things like your quad because that can come weak over the months of sort of rest. I also use that for things like hop testing. So the specific hop tests that I would recommend are something like a single leg hop for distance, triple leg hop for distance, your key balance tests like the Y balance test, vertical jump test as well, I think is really useful. Now, in terms of what you would expect them to be able to achieve compared to the other leg is a really difficult question to answer, I think, partly because patients progress differently, but um, also because you've got to remember that when you have an Achilles tendon rupture, the anatomy of the tendon is never going to be entirely the same. So a normal Achilles tendon spiralizes around 90 degrees before it attaches onto the calcaneus and when you rupture your Achilles you of course lose that sort of spiralizing anatomy and so you lose some of those that ability to transmit force so well and so it's it's never going to be a hundred percent of the other side if you think about a weekend warrior who wants to get back to you know playing football a couple of times a week I think that within 75 percent of the opposite leg at around the sort of eight to nine month mark is reasonable on a limb symmetry index. But for your elite athletes, you know, who are getting daily physio and, you know, the, that sort of elite level performance is so important, then of course you want more than 90% of the opposite side before they're sort of returning to high level sports participation. Um, so yeah, those are some of the key things that I would look at. Let's take that uh, sport, be it elite sport or return to sport um, for your weekend warrior. When you're doing that final phase of rehabilitation, are you ever doing anything in terms of neuromuscular control training or um, are you ever doing anything in terms of, uh, shall we call it, psychological training for being back on the field any hesitations that the player may or may not be facing um going back onto the field how are you dealing with that side of it 
Yeah, so in terms of the neuromuscular control, I think that's something that starts pretty early on. So the minute that they're out of the boot and they can sort of walk normally in normal footwear, I would start some sort of basically neuromuscular control and balance exercises because, you know, they've been in the boot for so long um, that that's often impaired. And of course, their confidence as well with single leg loading is also impaired. So that's something that starts relatively early. I also find these patients often struggle with things like dynamic knee valgus, but that's largely to do with restrictions around the ankle joint rather than a a neuromuscular control issue. Um, And then when it comes to the sort of psychological readiness to return, I think this is something that's really well recognized within ACL injuries. And I often use the... Is it ACL RSI, the Return to Sport Index, which is a really good marker for establishing psychological readiness to return. I don't think they have an equivalent within the Achilles, but it's certainly something that I think is necessary um, because it can be a huge concern. You know, the fear of re-rupture is really significant um, for patients. So it's really important to explore that with them. I'm probably less involved at that stage. I tend to get more involved with the acute hospital care. And then when the patient is ready to return to sport, they tend to be referred to a local physio for more input with that. Um, So I don't know of any specific outcome measures, but I think it is a really important consideration. Okay, interesting. And then the later phases of the rehab, uh, similar for both um, conservative rehab or for the operators. So now we've sort of trodden down that uh, conservative pathway. What are the key differences between um, the operated versus non-operated right at the beginning stages in someone? Because you also mentioned that generally speaking, we tend to see that uh, people who have been operated uh, retain or uh, regain their strength slightly quicker. Yeah, absolutely. There are a few key differences between surgical and conservative management. So historically, it was kind of accepted that if you had surgery, your risk of re-rupture was lower. And if you had conservative management, you had a higher risk of rupture, but a lower risk of other complications. So some of the complications associated with surgery are things like wound breakdown, deep wound infections, sural nerve injury. Um, And then, you know, this risk of re-rupture is a historical thing that was based on some papers around the sort of late 1990s and early 2000s. So there's a particular paper released by Khan in 2004. Um, And they found that the re-rupture risk for surgery was around, I think, 3%. And the re-rupture risk for patients who were managed um, non-operatively was around 13%, I think. And ever since then, it's been sort of generally accepted that conservative treatment has a higher risk of re-rupture. And I hear people tell patients this all the time. But actually, we've had quite a lot of research published since then, which shows that the the risks are actually fairly similar. So there was a study published by Willits in 2010 that found it was around a 3% risk for both operative and non-operative treatment. And then a a large study by Wallace in 2011, which had more than 900 cases, found that the overall risk for non-operative management was actually around 3%. So it's kind of hopefully being accepted now that the rupture risks are fair, the re-rupture risks are fairly similar, but it really, really depends on the conservative management protocol that's followed, how quickly you can get that patient in full ankle equinus and how well you can immobilize that patient so that those tendon ends come together and the tendon heals in optimum length and tension. So that's really what's crucial. Okay. And what about in the early stages itself um, with regards to uh, surgical? Are there any changes in the initial protocol that happens? So 
For me, not really. So the overall progressions and content of the rehabilitation and advice that's given is fairly similar, except that patients tend to progress through the protocol slightly quicker if they're managed conservatively. So they don't need to spend quite so long in the boot. And you can be a little bit more aggressive with progressing them, either removing the wedges from the boot or changing the angle on the vacoped brace. The main issue with the surgically managed patients is that they might suffer a little bit more with loss of range they might be a bit tight rather than having issues with excessive lengthening which is more common in the patients who are managed conservatively so any patient that's managed conservatively i'm pretty strict about explaining the risks associated with stretching in those early stages so i kind of explain that it's really important to allow that tendon to heal in a good position without overstretching it. Because if you do overstretch it in the early stages, they can have issues with chronic lengthening or failure of the gap to close. And that's really hard to overcome. And they end up having issues with poor plantar flexor power at push off. And you know that, that could be a long-term thing for them. Whereas with the surgically managed patients, that's less of a concern and actually tightness is probably a little bit more of a concern so that that group you might be less strict about early stretching limiting the early stretching yeah okay and from the sounds of it then it almost doesn't matter to some extent what way you're going to go uh, surgical non-operative from what you're saying if they have similar re-rupture rates they both have um their downsides okay surgery has the general issues that you have with surgery plus a couple of nerve issues uh, attached to it are there any particular reasons that someone may go one way uh, more so than the other or one might be more inclined to go one way than the other so Of course, the patient ultimately has to have some sort of input into the decision. And, you know, you give them the information about the benefits and risks and come to some sort of collaborative decision on it. But there is there are some criteria out there that can be really helpful in making those decisions. So um, the SMART protocol um, has some really useful criteria. So if the patient is under 55, Um, and they have a rupture in the body of the tendon. And on ultrasound, when the patient is in full ankle equinus, the tendon ends or the gap between the tendon ends is more than a centimeter, then that patient is less likely to do well with conservative management and they're likely to be a good candidate for surgery. Um, According to the SMART protocol, anyone who have any other patient basically so patients who have closure of the gap will all be managed conservatively using the smart protocol and that's including their elite athletes so they have professional rugby players professional ballet dancers they're all managed conservatively unless specifically requested by the patient um, if they follow, they fit within that criteria, which I think is really interesting because it definitely um, contradicts what a lot of other specialist centers might be doing. So a lot of foot and ankle consultants will manage all of their elite athletes operatively. And I can see why, because there is some evidence to suggest that actually later down the line, if you compare operative to non-operative management, patients who are managed operatively tend to get an earlier return of strength and they tend to perform better, about 20% better on isokinetic strength testing. So there was a really interesting study by Lanto um, et al, which was a Finland study in 2016. 
um, and they found that the surgical group were about 24% stronger on isokinetic strength testing at six months and 18% stronger at 18 months. So if you're thinking about your elite athlete where high level performance is absolutely essential and you know that last few kilograms on a strength test or those last few centimeters on a hop test really do make that difference then you know maybe we should be managing those operatively when you look into the details of the study though i think you do need to take this study with a pinch of salt because when you actually look at the rehab protocol that was followed they did use the vacoped dynamic boot but they didn't follow the smart protocol so some of the exercises were I guess not the kind of thing that we would want from an elite athlete so it was basic ankle range of movement some plantar flexion with a band then some double leg heel raises and some calf stretches but there wasn't really any logical strength progressions they didn't really seem to be overly supervised doing the exercises and all patients seemed to do the same reps and sets so I think it would be really interesting to compare the smart protocol to surgery when it comes to those long-term strength markers um, interestingly when it comes to things like the ATRS score, they actually perform similar. So they have similar outcomes despite this significant difference in strength. So it's possible that things like the ATRS score actually aren't sensitive enough to detect those subtle changes in strength that you see. Okay, fascinating. Um, so, all right, with that being said then, for your weekend warrior, if they've got that one centimeter gap, they could take it or leave it with regards to uh, surgery or not. And the, for an elite athlete, it's questionable whether or not it's necessary to throw them under the knife. What about um, in regards or with regards to potentially pushing for an earlier return to play? Does that make a difference at all? Interesting. Yeah. And I, I don't work in elite sports, so I don't have any of those pressures from coaches to get a patient back earlier. And like I said, this is the type of injury where you do need to be patient. And I think if you try and get a patient back before they're ready to return, you're putting them at risk of, of re-rupturing. You know, the tendon remodels so slowly, in particular the Achilles tendon, because it's so poorly vascularized. So, you, you know, the remodeling phase starts around about the eight-week mark, but it continues for over a year. So if you're pushing for an earlier return to sport, you're in potentially dangerous territory. However, like you say, with the surgically managed patients, they do tend to return a bit quicker. So that, again, could make a massive difference because within the realms of professional sports, two months is a long time. If you can get someone back a couple of months quicker, of course, they're going to operate. Yeah, absolutely. And then before we go on to talking about um, pitfalls within rehab, you mentioned a couple of times there, the use of ultrasound. Now, I have yet to see ultrasound being used for uh, an Achilles rupture. And before anyone wants to pipe off in the comments, we don't mean ultrasound to heal the tendon. Uh, <laughs> we oh, mean yeah. ultrasound <laughs> for imaging, diagnostic ultrasound. Um, can you talk, talk us through that? Because when you mentioned this to me, it, it, blew my mind that this was a thing that was being done it made complete sense when you said it but I was like why, why have I never seen this before yeah absolutely so in specialist centers that are used to seeing these patients ultrasound is absolutely you know the gold standard imaging modality of choice in an acute Achilles tendon rupture and the reason for that is, you know, it allows for a dynamic assessment. So you can pop the patient in prone, you can dorsiflex and plantar flex the foot, you can look at the tendon fibers dynamically and, and you know what's happening. Um, but the most important thing that it can add value to is, is looking at that tendon gap. 
And that make that really helps to guide the management. You do not need an ultrasound scan to diagnose an Achilles tendon rupture. You can diagnose an Achilles rupture based on the history and you know your objective findings. It's really to help you make decisions about how you're gonna manage that patient. So you wanna know, do the tendon ends come together and how close are they? Are they within a centimeter? And what position is the ankle in when you know the tendon ends come together? Um, so it's really, really useful in terms of making management decisions. There are some studies that, um, or some protocols rather, that actually don't use ultrasound. So there's a Leicester Achilles management protocol, I think it's called. So it's called the LAMP protocol. And they're very similar to the SMART protocol, but they don't ultrasound any patients at all. And they put them straight into a, an Aquinas cast. And the rationale behind that is most patients who have an Achilles rupture will, uh, the tendon ends will come together if they're placed in full ankle Aquinas. Therefore, what's the point in ultrasounding if nearly every patient um, responds the same to being put in that position. But there, there are scenarios where patients have a really, really significant gap and you put that ankle in full Aquinas and those tendon ends don't come together. And if you don't ultrasound that patient, you're gonna have a, a really negative impact on their long-term outcomes. And I can remember a patient really well. Um, so she was 40, really active, think she was into triathlon so she did a lot of running she did some cycling she was really into swimming she was super super fit and she had an Achilles rupture she didn't have an ultrasound um, she was put into an Aquinas cast um, and then she ended up being referred to me I think for a second opinion because she just really wasn't progressing with her rehab and I had a look at um, the Simmons triad it was fairly late down the line at this stage she was out of the boot and, you know, she had a large palpable gap. She had a minimal reaction on the Thompson squeeze test and her Mattel's test was positive. So, you know, the foot was resting in a different position. Um, and she ended up being escalated to orthopedics and having an MRI scan. And she had a three centimeter gap. Um, so, you know, if that lady had been ultrasounded early, it's possible that we may have been able to identify a large gap that wasn't amenable to conservative management. She may have been operated on and, you know, she probably would have done quite well, but instead she's left with this chronically lengthened tendon with a large gap. She's now got lots of scarring. She's got some retraction of the tendon ends and she's just not going to do very well. You know, she might be a candidate for something like an FHL transfer, but, had we ultrasounded her, we could have made a massive difference to her quality of life and return to overall function. So yeah, in an acute setting, ultrasound is the gold standard. But if you're looking at more of delayed or chronic presentations, um, you, it's, it becomes much more difficult to interpret the ultrasound scan because you've got the hematoma, you've got lots of scar tissue, everything looks a bit heterogeneous on the scan. So that's when you might want to consider something like an MRI. And you can also look at things like tendon retraction and fatty infiltration, etc. You mentioned something interesting there. I'm yet to see it. How often have you seen uh, FHL replacements? I haven't actually. I'm more involved in the pre sort of patients who present with a rupture and then, you know, how do we manage those? I haven't seen any that, oh no, I have, I've seen one. So an elderly gentleman um, who had a, a significant Achilles rupture. I think it was a missed Achilles rupture. And he had a really large gap. Um, and he was seen privately by a private foot and ankle consultant that I know. Um, and he en ended up going on to have this FHL transfer. And he did really well. He did really, really well. So I think that, you know, patient selection for those is key, but they can have a good um, functional outcome. It's going to be for the low activity demand patient. So this isn't going to be appropriate for, a, you know, an athlete who... Oh wants to participate in badminton or basketball, you know, where they've got high energy storage and release 
demands. But for an older person who wants to be able to get back to walking, I think it's a really good option. That brings us up onto the other thing that I'd mentioned there. What are some of the common pitfalls that you've come to see over time? Because like you mentioned, sometimes you see people as a, a second referral further up the line. Yeah, so I think one of the really big things for me that I have noticed is patients don't understand the seriousness of the injury. And um, it takes us back to what we talked about at the beginning. Pain is not a predominant feature. We know that patients associate pain with the severity of the pathology. We know that from lots of other MSK problems that patients present with. So when patients don't have a lot of pain, I think they think, okay, this can't be that bad. Um, and then if they go through A&E and fracture clinic, and then they come to physio and, you know, none of this is explained to them, I think they don't take it as seriously. And it's understandable if they don't really understand the gravity of it. Um, and especially if they're put straight into a boot which they can kind of take off. I think a lot of them do remove the boot, you know, perhaps when they're sleeping at night in those early stages um, and they don't com fully comply with the advice. And some of them, you know, I see some of them later down the line and they say, I never knew it was gonna take nine months. So I think it's really, really important in those early stages that we sit down with them and we explain the injury, we explain the prognosis, we explain the rehabilitation process, the importance of complying with that early stage advice, which if you can get the treatment right in those early stages, you can have such a dramatic impact on their long-term outcomes. And if you get it wrong, it, it can be really difficult to reverse that. Um, there was something else I was going to say, and I think that is another value of, of casting a patient early. So if you put them in an Aquinas cast, I think, and this is something that Anne-Marie Hutchison talks about a lot within the SMART protocol, it does reinforce the severity of the injury to the patient. Whereas putting them in a boot straight away where they can take it off, they just don't take it as seriously. So yeah, I think one of the pitfalls for me is not appropriately educating the patient about the injury, the prognosis, and you know the importance of complying with rehab. And then I think another pitfall is probably trying to accelerate the process and progress too early. So for me, it does need time and it does need a lot of patience. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I've kind of talked about it to death, but not achieving adequate ankle equinus in those early stages, especially if the patient is managed conservatively, will have a really negative effect on their ability to progress throughout the later stages because they will have a lengthened tendon. They may have a persistent gap. They're going to really struggle to achieve that push off propulsion and that sort of explosive capacity of the calf during things like jogging and running so yeah those are some of some of the key pitfalls and then I guess something that I see a lot that drives me a little bit mad is is pushing, pushing those aggressive stretches too early as well so for the conservatively managed patients I don't stretch them at all in the early stages and I would probably only really give them stretches if they are tight or restricted um, and I sort of, you have to explain that to them as well. You know, they often feel like they need to stretch. Patients often say this with lots of different MSK problems. They feel this need to stretch. And sometimes even if you give them plantar flexor strengthening exercises, they'll say, oh, I added in a couple of stretches. So I think it's really important to get across to them that they shouldn't be stretching in those early stages. And it, for me, it's something that comes naturally. You know, once you get them weight bearing and once you get them walking with a normal gait pattern, they're gonna get some normal functional loading through that muscle tendon unit complex and you don't need to start giving them passive stretches. Sounds to me like a, a lot of it comes down to managing patient expectations and really clear cut communication by managing those expectations you eliminate um hopefully the patient going to do those early stretches or you eliminate that patient going and doing things earlier in the rehab process than what you may have had planned and like you mentioned that early casting acts as almost a, a psychological break um 
to uh, almost throw a handbrake on the patient's ideas of how fast they're going to be able to go and, and do things and how fast they're going to be able to return back to uh, their standard uh, normal activities kind of thing if someone's Absolutely. in a car the yeah. patient has to buy into the process and when you look at the re-ruptures so the, they're most likely to re-rupture in that 10 to 12 week mark when they're weaning off the boot and they think oh my tendon's healed I can start returning to my normal activities it doesn't hurt too much everything's fine and you know they perhaps go to the pub and have a few drinks or you know they um take it off when they're kind of getting public transport and jogging for the bus and that's that crucial time when actually it's so important that they understand the risks and understand the importance of complying with the advice and often it's not the patient's fault if they they weren't given that information of course if they were given that information and they decided to ignore it then that's a different story but yeah if we can really get that information across to the patient and allow them to take an active role in their rehabilitation I think that that will make such a huge difference um, and you know we need to give them appropriate sources of information so we know that patients only take on board about 10 percent of what is explained to them within a consultation so you need to give them some sort of written information to go away with uh, so we've created um, patient information leaflets that has all of the information about sort of progressions when to take the wedges out if they're using an aircast boot you know when to escalate concerns to the physio or the consultant etc so i think that's really really important absolutely and i can't echo the sentiments enough of that sort of uh, 10 to 12 week mark i find that with a lot of post-op patients between sort of eight to 12 weeks is really the tricky danger zone before that you don't really have many concerns because they're with crutches or they're in a boot or something and as soon as they get out and they start to feel a bit frisky and a bit fresh then yeah they take those risks of running for the bus or they take that risk of uh I'm going to have a few more drinks tonight and sod the world. I'm going to going to go for a little bit of a run or what have you, because they're feeling dangerous. Um, but you also mentioned before about the stretching side of things and how generally speaking, you try to avoid it in the conservative, especially in the early phases. Are there, and you also mentioned complex a little earlier on in the chat. Are there any other adjuncts that you use as part of your treatment? Are there any manual therapy techniques or anything that you use as part of it? Yeah, absolutely. So in the early stages, when they sort of wean off the boot, they often really stiff in their ankle joint and really stiff in their subtalar joint and, you know, all the joints of their midfoot. So I definitely think manual therapy has a role there, um, you know, the exact mechanism behind what's it, what it's doing we could debate that for days but I definitely use manual therapy in the early stages you've got to be careful obviously that you're not putting too much um, pressure through the either repair site or rupture site um, so you just need to be a little bit careful with your handling but I would definitely use manual therapy in those early stages where they're weaning off the boot because that can really help with their sort of gait as well so you know that um, so trying to get a normal gait pattern is so, so important. And, you know, you're, if you can get appropriate push off propulsion, that is going to have so much more value for tendon function than doing, you know, your static exercises or whatever you're doing. And if you can mobilize their ankle and get a slightly better gait pattern, that's so valuable. Um, other adjuncts that I use, so when the patient comes out of the boot, I'll always um, encourage them to use a one centimeter heel lift. So I get them to put it in both shoes just to take a little bit of tension off the tendon when they're walking. Um, I don't use BFR, but I do know that some places are really keen to use it as an adjunct. You've got to navigate the risks of DVT, obviously, when you're sort of occluding the limb. But I think it could definitely have a role um, for patients. It's not something that I'm overly familiar with just because I don't use it that often, but definitely something to consider for sure. Interesting. The use of BFR on a Achilles rupture, I imagine that could be potentially quite useful. So you mentioned 
that elderly gentleman who had the FHL replacement. Now, you suspect that he was potentially a missed rupture. What, if any, are the detrimental dangers for someone that is a missed rupture patient that, that goes two, three weeks further down the line undiagnosed and just kind of cracks on with life and says, yeah, do you know what? I'm, I'm happy out, happy as Larry. I can do everything I want. Suddenly on a Saturday, they realize, oh, wait, I can't play football. All right, go down to the doctor, get myself checked out. And bam, you're two weeks late on an Achilles rupture. Yeah. So, and it is pretty common, like I said uh, at the beginning, because pain isn't a predominant feature, patients often don't go to A&E. And especially with COVID times, we saw so many patients who ruptured their Achilles and they were too scared to go to the A&E department. So they just didn't present and then they ended up coming much, much later down the line. And unfortunately, it does have a really negative effect. So the main issue in that sort of, so after a period of about two days, you get this consolidated hematoma that forms between the tendon ends, and then that stops the gap from closing. And so typically, if patients present late and there's a large hematoma there, you know, it, it might be an indication that actually they, sh they, they need surgical management or a surgical opinion on that. And then if you're getting after that, so, you know, weeks and weeks down the line, you're starting to get some remodeling of the tendon ends and scar that that solid sort of consolidated hematoma starts turning into sort of um, granulated tissue and scar tissue. And, you know, then you're going to get a really lengthened um, persistent gap between those tendon ends. Um, so it's so, so important that patients present to A&E as early as possible so that they can be put in ankle equinus and then, you know, referred to fracture clinic, perhaps have an ultrasound scan and then decisions can be made about whether or not they need to be managed conservatively or operatively. Interestingly, uh, Anne-Marie Hutchison, who um, was involved in the SMART protocol that we've talked about already, has actually done some research on delayed presentations and whether or not this SMART protocol that they developed can be applied to late presentations. So they looked at patients who present at two to six weeks, so a two to six week delay. And they did actually find pretty good outcomes for patients who were managed conservatively despite this delay. So the eight, they did pretty well, I think, on ATRS scores. Um, their re-rupture rates were fairly reasonable. Um, I can't remember if they looked at strength outcomes or not, but you know, there is some initial preliminary work that suggests that perhaps some of these patients can be managed conservatively. But you've got to look that you've got to strictly follow the smart protocol and you know you can't really deviate from it it's very um it's very clear on the components within it that they expect you to follow and the sort of logical progression so um yeah interesting that you say that because i i know um a couple of people that have had that um missed rupture and have had issues um after the fact and the the issues tend to be more so around the the strength side of things in in the long term and um in fact my my other half has one side operated and one side not she's ruptured both fantastic wow. yeah and it's always the um non-operative side that tends to give issues um and i again I said it right at the start that's where my bias kind of is as you know, we go by a lot of what we see as well as well as what we read but um, sometimes seeing is believing as they say and and that's one of the examples that I have in the past given to patients of operative versus non-operative of you know mm. if there's issues it's on that side if there's strength deficits it's on that side yeah um, I yeah, absolutely. And you know what, in some ways, surgery is almost the simpler option, because you bring the tendon ends together, you stitch, you stitch the tendon ends together. And you know, you're achieving optimum length and tension straight away. So you don't have those issues with a gap. You don't have those issues with lengthening. You're less likely to get chronic calf atrophy and, you know, suboptimal return to 
function and strength. Whereas with conservative management, I think you can achieve success, but you are so reliant on the intricacies of the protocol that you follow. You have to get early Aquinas. Um, you have to have a good boot immobilization strategy. You have to have a rigorous protocol. The patient has to comply with that protocol. Um, so it's a bit more complex in terms of the things that can go wrong, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or hopefully not absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, interesting. Um, what would be then your sort of top three tips for someone who uh, is working in this field and uh, what is dealing with these sorts of patients? So we talked about some of them already in terms of, you know, educating the patient, making sure they understand the prognosis, the seriousness of the injury, etc. Um, but I guess in terms of top tips, so for me, something that I think is really, really important is collaborating with the MDT if you have access to that. And I think that when you look at patients who do really well in certain centers, they've got a really, really cohesive, collaborative, multidisciplinary pathway. The physios communicate with radiology, they work with AME, they communicate with the orthopedic team and every, the transitions and the progression seem so much more smooth so if you're working in an nhs setting and you're sort of sharing some of the things that we talked about at the beginning with the variations in in practice then i think it's really important to try and sort of collaborate with with the other professions um, within your your hospital trusts so i think that's probably one of my top tips um, the other is in my opinion all patients should have an ultrasound scan um, which should should not be used for the diagnosis, but it should be used to make decisions about the management. And the decision to operate should be based on specific criteria, which is detailed really clearly within the SMART protocol. And patients should all, in my opinion, if they're managed conservatively, start in an Aquinas cast to just get that optimum length and tension um, that can set you up for a much more successful rehabilitation process. So for those people listening, where is it they can find you if they want to find out more or find out more about what you're doing or where you're going to be lecturing? Yeah, so the best um, way to contact me if anyone had any questions, I'm more than happy to help out if I can, would be on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is at emarlo 89 um, so I'm happy for people to message me if they'd like to. Um, I'm also doing some courses um, coming up this year. So I'm doing a foot and ankle course in Belgium, if anyone's listening in Belgium. So that's happening in June alongside Smart Education. Um, and I'm going to hopefully start rolling that out in the UK as well. Um, but most of the stuff that I do will be published on my Twitter page. Lizzie, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you giving up your evening to uh, spend some time and talk to Kelly with us. No problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely to chat. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time. As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time, peace.